title of this documentary, In the Land of the Perpetrators, of course, this, this was when I first read it, it was a bit puzzling to me. Um, but then I remembered this speech which our president, uh, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, he delivered in uh, 2020 in Yad Vashem on the, on the 23rd of January. And I would like to conclude my remarks with a, with a quote of this, um, of this speech. So I quote, the perpetrators were human beings. They were Germans. Those who murdered, those who planned and helped in the murdering, the many who silently towed the line, they were Germans. These are tough facts to acknowledge for every German, young or old, but they are true. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, and uh, first of all, thank you, Beth, for hosting us. It's uh, it's a real honor to be here, and it's a pleasure. And uh, I'm here with a very small delegation: um, Hans Pfeiffer, who made the film; Tim Klimesch, who was responsible for documentaries in our house. I don't see him. Where is he gone? So I oh, see in, in the corner there. And then Chris Jumpelt, he's uh, traveling with me. He's uh, head of the international relations, and um, I don't want to say anything because uh, too much because I'm, I'm, I'm speaking later on in, in this panel discussion, and I don't I don't want to be between you and the film. But I just want to say one thing that I'm really honored that the two protagonists are here with us uh, tonight and are uh, willing to talk to us. It's always a really moving thing when you, as a German. Um, have the chance to speak to Holocaust survivors. And uh, it is a special feeling, and you can't neglect it. And uh, so I think it's something where I can only say thank you so much what you do in this work, that you tell about their stories. And we are really thankful that uh, you are here. And uh, I'm looking very much uh, forward to have a discussion later on. Thank you so much for making this amazing film that just highlights you know another story that not very many people know about that's such an important story to be told and I wanted to introduce Jordana Gessler our VP of Education and Exhibits um, who will lead our panel tonight so Jordana welcome Thank you everyone for being with us this evening to really discuss, I would say, a plethora of important topics that are not always discussed when we talk about and learn about the Holocaust. And, you know, I, I always thought the Holocaust didn't really end in 1945, right? The war ends, the camps are liberated, <coughs> survivors in hiding are able to come out. But what is lingering? What is in people's minds and their souls, their health? These things continue, right? And the experiences continue, especially in these displaced persons camps, which were so critical. Not every Holocaust survivor was in one, but everyone at the end of 1945 or in the spring of 45 thought, what is home? Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? And how do I move forward? And these displaced persons camps were very important for community building, for holidays. I mean, to really think about it, how does somebody who has been persecuted, tortured because of their identity, then continue to celebrate that identity? How do people who've watched their entire families be murdered start a family? And one important note is, in 1945, there was still a quota system in the United States. The British were not letting any survivors into the mandate in Israel. People had nowhere to go until 1948. So these displaced persons camps were crucial. Um, I do want to start um, the conversation for, with a question for Peter. As the general director of Deutsche Welle, can you share why you felt that your organization was the right one to produce this specific documentary and tell this story? And what was the message impact you hoped it would have for the larger international community? First of all, um, thank you um, again for hosting us and uh, 
having this opportunity um, to show this uh, film to um, people who are directly affected by this history. And uh, I think uh, we as a German uh, broadcaster and we are public service broadcaster for international audiences, um, I think we have an obligation to uh, look at the past, uh, uh, especially the past where uh, Germans and Germany uh, has a responsibility. And uh, so I think the, the Holocaust uh, is in the center of this history. And uh, um, so we, we produce, um, we have produced several documentaries mm -hmm. and we do a lot of uh, work about history, not only in television, but on, on, on YouTube or in, in other social media formats. And uh, we think that's our obligation. And uh, I think we have also in a, in a climate uh, internationally, where we see that anti-Semitism is uh, unfortunately on the rise, that racism is on the rise, and uh, discrimination, polarization, authoritarian, right-wing populist uh, um, are on the rise. We have to do everything we can. And I think uh, showing this uh, um, history is, is that what we can contribute. I mean, we, we, can't, we can't do miracles, but uh, media has an effect. And uh, so I think this is why we're doing this. And uh, um, we are airing these documentaries uh, around the world. So it, it, it's, in, it's in English, it's in, in Russian, it's in, in Hindi, it's in, in, in Arabic. So uh, a lot of people will see it. Thank you. Of course, thank you so much. And Hans, considering the fact that you made this film and you are a filmmaker and a storyteller, why this specific story? Well, it's the right place to talk about because it all started in a museum. Mm -hmm. And I was visiting a museum in 2017 in Nuremberg where there was an exhibition about the Nuremberg trials against the mass murders. And uh, a tiny photography was catching my attention which showed that in 51, 4,000 people of Landsberg were uh, campaigning for, uh, for the uh, mass murders. This is the photo in the documentary. And I never heard of that. I was, it was really catching my, uh, catching my attention, not only because there was something like this, but in a small town with 12,000 people, if 4,000 are gathering, and as historian Edith Rhymes said, it were not just murders, they were some of the most responsible murders, mass murders, and that everybody was taking solidarity and realizing then that um, at the same time there was this town in a town of thousands of, of, of survivors and that they, that for me was very uh, disturbing and, uh, and, and I was wondering why I never heard about it, why I never learned about it. And I felt that it's worth uh, taking research and taking a deeper look and I think it's worth telling because this time of the displaced persons I learned then about when I contacted the dialers in Landsberg and asked them about this photo if I might have the rights to uh, use the photo for Deutsche Welle for an online report. And then they told me all about the city and uh, I think it was, uh, it's not talked that much about it. And I, as a German who was very interested, in, and I'm reporting a lot about these topics, never heard about displaced persons camps. Mm -hmm. And as the dialers said, like they, they were living in that town. They asked th their parents' generation about this 7,000 survivors in a town of 12,000. They said, no, there had been no Jews after war. <laughs> and this is kind of mentality. And I think why I wanted to tell the story was it's not about Landsberg. Landsberg is an example, but you have to realize Landsberg, uh, the Germans are pretty good in downplaying their own knowledge or their own role. And to realize that Landsberg um, was a place of mass murder, it was not just one place, it was 30,000 Jews had been, like, like Joseph, like, like Jacob, had been there, and 10,000 were murdered in Landsberg, in a town of of 12,000 people again, and that these exterior camps of the concentration camps were hundreds of them all over Germany. It was not only Auschwitz and Poland or the other extinction camps. It was all over Germany. So it's not about Landsberg. There are so many hundreds of communities where people knew 
And that's really touched me when Jacob and Joseph asked about, did people know about? And you both were kind of laughing. Of course they knew. Of course they knew. So um, I thought this, this film is not for a German audience, as Peter said. It's for an international audience. And I think it was tell, worth telling to the world. And we have an Arab program, Arabic program. Mm. And uh, it's worth telling in all these languages to, to deepen the knowledge about Holocaust and, and the time after the war. Mm. And that history doesn't end. So it was going on. How has the response been, um, either Peter or Hans, how is the, how, what are the responses that you've received from this documentary? We journalists always regard at numbers and if it's successful <laughs> in, on YouTube or on other. And uh, for me, most humbling was that the dialers, whom I all shall greet you very kindly of, and also from George Lightman, who couldn't be here. He's 98 now, living in Berkeley. He has to take care of his 99-year-old wife. <laughs> 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 and uh, the dialers told me that every week they got a contact, a phone call by people from all over the world, displaced persons, who asked, my parents were, or, or, their, or their second generation, my parents had been there, do you have anything in the, in, I've seen the documentary. And so that was very, um, that was humbling me that it, on a weekly basis there was contact and there's one very special uh, contact I, I was, grateful for that Deutsche Welle produces in so many languages because there was a group from Palestine in Munich and they called the dialer said we are here in Munich and we want to visit the memorial site and they told them on the phone well there is nothing uh, it is locked <laughs> we we don't have it yeah but we've seen the documentary in Arabic we are from Palestine and we would like to visit it we are an hour away and they said wow that's amazing and uh, for me it was as a journalist, it was uh, maybe the, the best feedback that uh, we as journalists could, uh, even if it's just one single group of people, <laughs> could uh, make people interested in history, and which means in taking responsibility for nowadays. Thank you. <clears throat> Joe, I want to ask you, you speak so frequently to schools and synagogues and museum visitors how is this experience in this film different from what you normally talk about? Well, there's, there's not much, actually not much different because I, when I talk about it, I talk about Landsberg, I talk about my, my experience. So, so I do talk, you know, let the, let the people know exactly what happened. That's why, so we, no, never, we should never stop talking about it because there's a lot of people still out there who never heard about the Holocaust. Like I was told, the schools I talked to, like 70% of the kids never heard about the Holocaust. So our job, a few survivors we was left, we have to spread the word to as many people as we can. And that's what we're doing. <clears throat> Jacob, when, yes. when you were first approached to be in this film, did it bring up any memories of those first days of liberation? Of course. It never leaves me. My wife of 63 years always asks me, aren't you ever going to forget? He said, yes, when you bury me, not before. But first of all, I want to thank the president of this, uh, of the Holocaust and the gentleman from Germany, Hans, you were specially because you have been more than a friend. And uh, yeah. I think you did a wonderful job. I want also to greet all of you 
of course, brothers and sisters, friends, and especially my family who is here, my wife of 63 years, mm -hmm. Edith, and my children are here, I think. I haven't seen him yet. <laughs> <laughs> Would you stand up, please? <coughs> Rachel, Ross, Josephine, and Charlie. <laughs> they are my life, of course. And uh, what can I say? I mean, I, I have stated whatever I could for the questions that Hans asked me. But I'm sure you have plenty of other questions that I might be able to answer and I might not. <laughs> this depends on the question, of course. <laughs> and who is asking it, of course. <laughs> so if, with no further ado, I would like to answer any of your questions. Anybody. Don't be shy. You're not going to hurt me. I've been hurt before. So it doesn't matter. Please, I appreciate whatever you want to ask me. And, and then border questions maybe you can answer. So with the quota still in place after the war, how did the survivors, how, how did the, the VPs get into the U.S.? Great question. So um, in 1948, the law changed, and Truman allowed the Jewish survivor refugees into the U.S., and in 1948, Israel was declared, and so all survivors could go to Israel as well. Some DP camps still did exist into the 50s, um, but people didn't want to go to the US. or were still working on paperwork, or had children, like had had found occupations, or were sort of you know had <coughs> some sort of life that they were building in Germany. And so by 1948, though the majority of those who wanted to leave were able to leave if they so chose to Israel or to to the US. I believe it was an executive order. Executive. Yeah, it was not going through Congress. Well, excuse me, but my story is a little different. <laughs> so I think now the question Quite is... Quite different. I worked for the UNRWA in Landsberg. And one day I was going to work. I worked in the Bekleidungsamt, which meant we uh, then gave out clothing that came from America and from everywhere else. And uh, there was always a wall with names on it, because everybody was seeking somebody. We did not know who is alive, who is not. And I have seen my name mentioned. Jacob Bressler, you are sought by a family in New York by the name of Samuels. Now, I was a child. They left before I was born. So I did not know who they were. So I had an uncle who also survived at that time. May I rest in peace, may his memory be a blessing. And I went up and I says, Uncle Gershon, who are those people? They're asking for me. And he says, Samuel, Samuel, I don't know anybody by the name of Samuels, but he says, I know a Newman family that went to England and then went to America. Maybe they are the people. To make the story short, I, uh, we started a correspondence and they brought me to the United States and they became my loving parents. I was, uh, at that time, 16. And Joe, how did you find your way to America? <coughs> Excuse me. I, well, I was living in Germany after I was liberated. I was living in Germany for four more years, but I had no place to go. He had to wait until some country opens up and try to take, want to take you in. So after four years, Canada said, we're going to take some people. So I went and registered, and then you have to wait until they call you. Took a long time. I didn't hear from them. 
In the meantime, while I was waiting for Canada to call me, I had a friend living in the next village where I lived, and he said, now you can go to Munich and you can register to go to America. So I went to Munich and I registered. In a very short time, I get on the to go to get checked out by the American doctor, then the FBI check you out. And then a short time, I get on the to go to the port, the Bremenhaven, to get the boat to come to America. And then I arrived in the United States on May 30th, 1949. So, at the time I was to America, I was about 24. No, I did. I did go after I was liberated. I did go back to see. I went back to see if any of my family survived, because I was. I lived in the Warsaw ghetto for five months, and I left my parents, two sisters and one brother in the Warsaw ghetto. And I got out with a sister and one brother, and that's the last time I saw him. So. I went back to see if anybody came back and survived, but uh, I went to the house, and the people who were living there were survivors actually on the f second floor, on the first floor were f Polish people, but I said none of my immediate family came and survived. One cousin I had, he was two years younger than I, and actually we were separated when, when I came to Auschwitz. And Dr. Mengele told me to go to the left. So I was separated from him and two of his uncles, his father's brothers. So he is the only one who survived, but he's in a different town. And so, and then it was very bad for survivors who came back to Poland. They killed a lot of survivors, because when they took the Jews out of the homes, the Polish people moved in, now some of the survivors came back. They didn't want to give up the homes. So they killed a lot of survivors. In one town named Kelce, they killed 42 survivors. So the Polish people who live in my house on the first floor asked me, if I'm going to stay, they're going to move out. I said, don't bother. And I went and went to get my cousin, and we went back to Germany. Jacob, did you return to Poland after you were liberated? Yes. I, oh. I did not, but uh, because I had nobody, nobody to go to. I knew they were all, everybody was killed. But I did go in 1967 with my wife to Poland, to my town. And they recognized me. They tapped me on the shoulder and they said, are you the Bresler boy? Wow. I said, yes, who are you? And she said, well, I walked with you in a restaurant at the beginning of the war. And it was quite emotional for us, you know, and uh, I did not return to Poland until 1990 again. But uh, it was, because I had, I had colleagues that I went to school with, and one, her name was Basia Debowska. We sent, we sat next to each other. I said, "Is Basia Debowska alive?" And they said, "Yes, she's a dentist." <laughs> I says, "I don't care. Would you take me to her?" <laughs> 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 and of course, I went there, and uh, it was. Seven years, uh, but uh, more than that, ten years later, actually. And uh, we fell upon each other and hugged and kissed. And uh, it was very emotional, very, very emotional. But I have learned to get over emotions if necessary, and I did. So uh, I had nothing to look for in Poland. 
because all my family, we were a clan of 65 people. And I am the only one. And as Joe said, there was a lot of residual and continued anti-Semitic violence yes. um, in yeah. many different countries and especially in Eastern Europe. And in fact, after about 1968, to be an open Jew in Poland was very dangerous. So even those who remained, many were driven sort of underground in a way to, to even conceal their identity further. There were, of course, some survivors who remained, but the majority um, did not. May I tell you why that happened? Because that time was the Palestine, the, the uh, Fatah was very active, and they forced Jewish, because uh, we, had a f a f we spoke to a f woman, a, gentle, a young lady, who was a judge, and they forced her to contribute to the Palestinian cause, and she refused, so they let her go. And she was glad to do it. So it had its causes, you know, so, uh, because the great, the, even today, I just heard today in, 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 in one of your Reports? News, news, news report, reports. I watch okay. it every day. I want you to know that. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> much interested. In it. And uh, because I also watch French 24 and, and Israel. I'm a news junkie, you know. So. <laughs> and uh, I learned a lot today that they just said today that the anti Semitism in Poland is so great that it's going back to the pro before the uh, war era. And I believe that because I, I'm sorry that I still am very emotional when I talk about it because I am a humanist. And to me, people are people all over the world. I don't care what they are, who they are, as long as they don't try to antagonize me and tell me that I have no right to live. Otherwise, um, I have lectured a lot in Germany. I have lectured in Austria. I have lectured at UCLA here. And uh, I was amazed that the people, the young students, what they did not know. They knew it was a Holocaust, but they didn't know anything about it. So I made terrific friends, and uh, I also wrote a book about my experiences. And it was read in, in, in front of them, and uh, they appreciated it. But they still could not comprehend the actual meaning of it because they asked me questions that were out of this world, really. And I, I couldn't answer it because I said, there is no answer for that. They wanted to know whether I read newspapers. I, I said, sure, <laughs> if I found them in the street somewhere. But uh, they, they have no, let me say this, people, survivors are here, I understand, you know what I'm talking about. Nobody can understand. There is no writer yet that has been able to put it down on paper with a span what had really happened. I documented my life, but uh, like my wife says, well, you didn't say anything. I says, what did you want me to say? That's the way I lived it. I am not going to make up stories. And I didn't want to traumatize kids who will be reading it. So I, I kept it very, very mild. But I have written many books, and uh, I, uh, I hope after my demise that
my daughter, where is she? <laughs> where she is? She's also from the film business, and uh, that she will make use of it because I uh, I am too old and tired, to be honest. Um, Jacob, thank you so much for sharing that. And Joe, I know you also speak to a lot of students. What are what is the feedback you receive from students? What are the types of questions they ask you? Oh, they ask. Yes. Oh. <coughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no. no, it's okay. No, they, well, they, ask, they usually ask normal questions of how how did you survive? You know that that's the most question being asked. How did you survive to get to be together 100 years old? How how did how did it happen? So I tell them that now there's no secret. It just keep busy. Just keep busy, and that will keep you going. My dear, may I answer that? Okay. If you can change humanity, you will get the Nobel Prize. You know that. <laughs> but you cannot change humanity. That's the way we were born, and that's the way we're going to end. May, uh, uh, please. Uh, what Joe. I say is the solution is only is to educate the young people. Just the education. That's the only way. And tell them what happened. And if you hear anything not right, don't be afraid to report what you see. And don't listen to Holocaust deniers. I call them they're crazy. The Holocaust denies because the evidence is still in existence today. You go to any camp, Auschwitz, Dachau, Majdanek, Treblinka, the ovens in the guest chambers are still there. And I've been back and I saw buses coming every day, thousands of people from all over the world. So that's why I said the Holocaust deniers, they're crazy. Don't listen to them. And that's the only way we can do is through education is the best way to stop anti-Semitism. Yes, um, uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely right. I think it's not an easy answer. It's, uh, um, it's education, but it's also to address injustice wherever it happens. And uh, it, it must be addressed if somebody's um, getting beaten up, or somebody's uh, or country invades another country, or um, something happening in Africa, and, and you have to be. We have to do this. We have to, as journalists especially, show what's going wrong in the world. And um, uh, but I don't think that we that we will have uh, an easy easy way out because history showed that. Unfortunately, people tend to repeat the errors of the Ancestors. And, uh, but this is not, not a general pessimistic note, but I think we have to work every day on, and, and fight anti-Semitism, racism, and, and, uh, and, and everything uh, what goes wrong. And I, I would maybe say that Holocaust deniers are, are not crazy. They are crazy, but they are also evil because they, they yeah. um, because they do much more um, <laughs> harm to to um, to the ones who have survived, but also to the potential next victims. And uh, and un unfortunately, there are a lot of potential next victims uh, in this world. Let me, well, um, it is, um, I think if you wear a kippah and you are in a, in a, in a, in, a in, in some areas, whether they are very much dominated by uh, right-wing people um, or uh, whether they're dominated by Muslims, um, and let's say uh, not every Muslim is an anti-Semite, just to put this clear. But they are young, young radicalized uh, people, and uh, so so it uh, it is 
I think would wouldn't say in general it's it's not not possible for a Jew to come to Germany. We have a, uh, luckily so many Jews living in Germany now, and uh, the strong communities. And as you see, so many uh, refugees from Ukraine, Jewish refugees, are now in Germany, and and it's a growing community. But one has to be clear: there are maybe some uh, some. Um, Areas where it is not uh, maybe wise to show your keeper. Um, this is very sad, but it is like it is. Peter, can I actually ask you a, a follow-up question? In the film, we hear this this term of light memory or light commemoration. Can you speak about this shift a little bit in Germany? Is it mostly light commemoration, or is there a lot of work in concentration camps and sites of mass atrocity to truly, truly commemorate what happened there and the victims? I think it's both. Yes. It's both. I think uh, there's a lot of serious work been done, yeah. and and people like uh, uh, like the the the, the dialers, uh, I think that there are more of yes. them. Yeah. There are. Yes. They are not alone. No. Um, but yes, uh, there are also this 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 thing that uh, um, maybe with the with the concert uh, you do something against anti-semitism yes you can do maybe maybe but i think you have to speak up that's that's you have to speak up and uh, i'm so grateful that uh, john jacob and everybody else who's working in these fields um, is there and uh, yeah we have to continue this and do everything we can well i was just back in germany in may this last may Celebrate the 78 years of liberation of Dachau. And I spoke to a lot of high school students in Dachau and to the general public. And it's I know the dealers very well, both a husband and wife. So now it's a different Germany today than it used to be. So it's... Let me yeah. maybe uh, let me tell a short anecdote because we're friends from Israel who live in Germany now for 25 years, and a month ago he called me and said, "Peter, I just want to have a German passport because of I'm I'm not so happy what's going on in Israel," and it was it's just, it really struck me because I said this is not possible. I mean, how can this be? I mean. Mm -hmm. You want a German passport because you don't feel safe in Israel, um, but but it happens and uh, it happened and uh, so so things are changing in Germany uh -huh. to the good. But also, let's be clear: we have a right-wing populist movement, um, which is uh, which is dangerous. They, they might not everybody not, is not automatically a Nazi, but there are too many of them with fascist ideas and 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 racist ideas, some of them anti-Semitic ideas. So it is, um, it is like in all over Europe, but also, also in the United States, I presume, without being an expert. But I think if you look at the polarization of the country and you look of some really Nazi movements, it is really dangerous. Uh, this, this. So we, we have to have to work on it. That that this these that people get to know about it. I mean, you can condemn as much as you want, but you have to educate and you have to show what's going on. Suzanne? First of all, thank you for doing what you've done. And I have kind of a multifaceted question, beginning with the fact that... I know we have a budget, an annual budget, which we get uh, from the German parliament via the German government. And uh, from this budget, we produce documentaries. So. I think this was not a documentary with a special funding, as far as I know. We did it out of our regular budget, and uh, sometimes we co-produce with other networks. But uh, yes, we also did a did a wonderful, uh, highly recommended documentary, which is uh, um, music uh, in the Nazi time, um, where we also have a portrait on on uh, the cellist of Auschwitz, uh, Laska um, Walfisch, and. Uh, 
um, compared to um, Leon Feuchtwanger, the uh, not Leon Feuchtwanger, excuse me, uh, Ford Wengler, excuse me. It's a bit late. <laughs> it's a bit late in my head. So, um, uh, so these kind of things we do out of our budget, and uh, we're not only doing uh, uh, history or, or uh, documentaries about the Holocaust uh, and, and and Nazi time, but it's a important part of our work. Yeah. Yes. May I, may I answer that? Yeah. Yeah. I, in all my lectures, I specifically said, I do not want children under the age of 13, because they cannot possibly comprehend that. And I didn't want to leave them with a the trauma. Now, my own children, they're I have two grandchildren, God bless them. They never, I never spoke to them about my experiences. They know, but they never asked me because I don't think that it is appropriate. They cannot possibly comprehend the trauma that we went through. It's impossible <laughs> for any child to work it out in their heads how, how come people kill people for what? Just because they were of a different religion? But uh, I would not recommend it for young children, no. Yet I do know that some of the survivors, they tell their small children already. They take them to Auschwitz with them. I would not do it. I would not recommend it. Joe, how? How do you feel about the right age to start talking about the Holocaust? No, I, I like to talk. Anybody wants to listen, <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's what I talk about. So, you know, I forgot to mention before, when I was back now in May, we met Hans there in the Lager 7 with the dealers. And just today, I'm still taking a lot of pictures. Yeah. Just, just this last May. So it was very nice to see Hans again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But this was a little anecdote about the film. You visited right after we finished the film. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it was something uh, I would love to put in the film that you were visiting Landsberg. But uh, the dialers told me, when we just finished finished the editing, like, uh, and I wanted to ask them something about archive stuff, they said, "Hans, in two days, uh, Joe will be here." <laughs> so, what? <laughs> yeah, he's visiting. He's for a week here, so uh, we made a little extra film, but uh, yeah, that was, was really very, amazing. Very, very <laughs> nice. As what was now, they told me, Joe, we have a surprise for you. So that was a surprise. I know. Uh, Hans came. I know we have a lot of questions. I'm going to let Mary ask a quick question. I have a question and an answer about you. I about me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I like to talk to everybody, but not to every age. I totally agree with you. I would very quickly explain a story, which is a true reason why you are so right I am a speaker in public to high school, to colleges, yes. to kids. I don't like to talk to children who are young. I feel like you do. I don't want to traumatize them. And I give you God bless you. I give you a quick example. I don't want to take your time, but this is really bringing home the reason what you said, with which I agree. Mm. When my granddaughter went to school, she was about eight years old. And some of the parents have known me as her grandmother, knowing that I am an Auschwitz survivor. Yes. And the mothers asked my daughter-in-law, you know, in the school there is an assignment, they talk about that. Uh, the kids would like to know, would you mind your mother-in-law, have 
have a little cafe one afternoon and some of the kids could come and she could talk to the kids. Like Joe, I talk to everybody, yes. I do it. Yeah. So my daughter, you know, has called over maybe 10 kids whose mothers were encouraging this little get together. I was very modifying my story. Sure. But I did tell them my story as an education and as leaving out the horror part because they were too young. Sure. But I gave them the base, the giant base of we were taken out of the homes, we were deported, we were selected, da da da. A week later, one of the mothers called me up and he said, Mary, I am so sorry, we appreciated what you did, but Valerie doesn't want to take any more showers. Any <laughs> more? <coughs> Joe, there is a difference to what age bracket. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Speak to the children. Mm -hmm. This girl only knew that we were taking a shower, and I really didn't bring it in as horribly the truth was. I only brought them on my shower, not the shower of the guest chamber. Yeah. But the shower concept alone, because she understood my hair was shaved, that's a big deal to an eight-year-old. Sure. And I decided, and Jordana knows, because she assigns me to speak <laughs> to groups, and the first thing I say, how old are they? I don't want to speak to kids who are longer than 10 or 12, or as you say, I don't usually, usually what I speak is junior high and high school. Yeah, that's what I do too. That's that's most of what I speak. That's that's yeah. Um, but I just say I'm I speak to anybody. <laughs> I'm the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors and have known about the Holocaust since I can remember. And so, if if you want to hear yeah. about how that traumatized me, we can be here all night. So I think this will be our last question because it's getting late. Go ahead. Well, Deutsche Welle is an international broadcaster, and we have a big, broad audience with our channels, uh, our, our um, programs on YouTube, for example. So we are not Netflix. We are Deutsche Welle, mm -hmm. so we have our, our own documentary um, a program on YouTube, for example. And we reach a very large audience, uh, so this film on, on YouTube has been watched by about uh, 270,000 people. And uh, for example, which is uh, something very amazing and uh, that's something great, and the Spanish program by almost 300,000 uh, people and the Hindi program by up to almost 200,000. Yeah. So um, we, as Deutsche Welle, we, are, we have a broad audience. So, and uh, it, it's not, just that small as here, yeah, well, I, and I mean, and it, in it is in German language, but um, this is uh, kind of the least important <laughs> program. You have to, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah. But just just to know, Deutsche Welle reaches about three hundred million weekly users yeah. in thirty-two languages. So it's it's kind of a big news media outlet, but that doesn't mean that all of these 300 million users watch this movie, one has to say. But the good thing about uh, having it on YouTube is that it had a so-called long tail effect. So it stays there, and that means that uh, there will coming more and more people. So if you go out and say, that's a great documentary, you, we have to see it, then we will see it slowly in our figures. So please go and say to all you know, this is a great movie, and all the, also the also the rest of the documentary channel is great. By the so way. I want to thank all of you for being here this evening. This was a, a really fascinating conversation. I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, I think the average age of our panelists might be eighty-five, <laughs> <laughs> which is tremendous. I'm one of the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> Ninety-five. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so moving into the Jewish New Year, I hope we can all continue to grow and learn and think about human resiliency, memory, and honoring the elders and in our community who are filled with so much wisdom. I would be amiss if I didn't plug Holocaust Museum LA is free on Sundays and we always have um, survivor speakers coming to speak. So please look at our website, hmla.org. Um, you can pick up one of our calendars at the front desk, sign up for our newsletter. There are a plethora of opportunities to hear from the Holocaust survivors in this room and from others and to really engage in this education. So thank you so much for coming. Happy and healthy new year. And thank you so much to our panelists, especially Joe and Jacob for being here. Thank you very much.